Hey there, interwebs. Welcome back to Howl Fascinating, and a joyous yule to all my pagan peeps. Sorry your holiday got stolen to be the alleged birthday of Western culture's favorite four-eyed horny hermaphrodite. Yes, you heard me correctly. We've already established that Mary Magdalene was no more likely a whore than a werewolf, but that's nothing compared to her biblical boyfriend. Jesus of Nazareth was a part-time carpenter and, depending on whom you ask, a lich, a unicorn, a homunculus, a hermaphrodite, a body horror monstrosity, and maybe even the messiah if there's enough time left in the day. If you're new to this channel, I'm irreverent about everything, so get used to it. Since this Sunday will be celebrated as the day of Jesus' birth, let's start by taking a look at the biblical babe. No, really, take a good look at him. You may now quite reasonably be wondering, why does he look like a little old man? Well, you see, that's because he's actually a homunculus, a miniature but fully formed human being. The image of a homuncular Jesus was a trend in medieval art, and it stems from the idea that he, being both the son of God and God himself, and more on that in a moment, would have been perfectly formed and unchanging throughout his life. This kind of implies that he must have always looked like an adult man, even as a baby. These depictions also weren't intended to be interpreted literally. In the words of art history professor Matthew Averett, the strangeness that we see in medieval art stems from a lack of interest in naturalism, and they veered more towards expressionistic conventions. Basically, the artists of the Middle Ages wanted a visual way to represent divine immutability, and thus we get a baby that looks like a middle-aged man. Ironically, the trend of depicting Jesus as a homunculus largely died out with the arrival of the Renaissance and its greater emphasis on realism, but that's also when the word homunculus was first coined, with alchemists at the turn of the 16th century popularizing the general concept. I also find it hilarious that some of these depictions go so far as to give Jesus a nasty case of patterned baldness, in stark contrast to the long, luscious locks he'd sport later in life. Moving on from the creepy old man face, is there anything else you notice about baby Jesus? How about here, in Peter Bruegel the Elder's Adoration of the Kings? Here's a hint, Caspar, the kneeling magus, is staring right at it. Yeah, it's Jesus' penis. No, I'm not joking. There are loads of paintings in which people are lining up to fondle, or simply ogle, the divine dingling. This might be related to the resurgence of secularism and anatomical studies during the Renaissance, but according to art scholar Leo Steinberg, author of The Sexuality of Christ in Renaissance Art and in Modern Oblivion, Jesus' complete incarnation was meant to represent his humanity, and thus his mortality, without which his later resurrection, and thus all of Christianity, wouldn't make any sense. In fact, Jesus' penis received special attention at the end of his life as well. It seems to have been something of a 16th century trend in Germany and the Netherlands to show Jesus with a post-mortem erection. Insert your own puns about the Passion of the Christ and the real wood of the true cross here. Interestingly, post-mortem erections are a real thing, occurring most commonly in men who have died in an upright position, such as sitting, or being crucified, as blood begins to pool in lower extremities. It's more likely, however, that the artists were once again attempting to highlight the subject's humanity and convey the rather secular message that sexuality is part of our humanity and thus nothing to be ashamed of, which is nice. But let's leave Jesus' penis alone for a moment and talk about his vagina instead. Yes, you heard me correctly. The sexualization of Christ on the cross gets even weirder. According to the story, the Roman soldier Longinus stabbed Jesus in the side to check that he was really dead. His spear went on to become the legendary Holy Lance, aka the Lance of Destiny or the Lance of Longinus, and the wound it left behind became a vagina, at least in ecclesiastical art. If you take a wander through medieval copies of the Book of Hours, you might think that Jesus' spear wound is rather suggestive of female genitalia, perhaps more so than simple coincidence should allow, and you'd be right. Apparently, Jesus began his life with male-patterned baldness and ended it with female genitalia, and we are a long way from divine immutability. Maybe I'm reading too much into this, though. Nope, there's even a motif known as Ecclesia born from Christ's side in which a human figure representing Christianity is emerging from Jesus' wound like it's a birth canal, so the creation of Eve wasn't the only biblical instance of gynogenesis from a ribcage. Taking things one step further, the yonic wound was often used as a mandorla, a type of frame in religious art, when showing Jesus' resurrection. Here, he is symbolically giving birth, or rebirth, to himself, making him his own father and his own mother. Actually, let's take a moment to talk about his mother, the mythical Virgin Mary. It became a trend in high medieval and renaissance art to show her inside a special type of walled-off yard known as a hortus conclusus, literally enclosed garden, to represent her perpetual virginity. Yes, perpetual virginity is an actual theological term and not just a scathingly accurate description of my freshman year of college. As visual metaphors go, this one's actually pretty reasonable. Like Mary's female reproductive system, the garden is a place of fertility, but also completely inaccessible. The concept of the fair maiden within the enclosed garden was first established by the Canticle of Canticles, also known as the Song of Solomon, and later artists ran with it. The only animal besides the virgin herself, which is shown inside her impenetrable hortus conclusi, is that most noble and divine creature, the unicorn. And yes, it's another depiction of Jesus. 
If you ask me, the use of the unicorn to represent Jesus is perfect symbolism. Both are slash were real-life entities whose magical powers were greatly exaggerated and their current iterations bear almost no resemblance to the original source. For once, however, the original animal which became the unicorn wasn't the rhinoceros. In this case, it was the animal known in Hebrew as the Reim. What is a Reim, I hear you cry? That's a good question. Unfortunately, the Hebrew Bible never gives a good detailed description. We only have vague references to them as mighty, untamable beasts with horns. When Greek authors were translating the Bible, they knew that didn't refer to goats, but not much else, so they called it a monokeros. When this jumped the language barrier again, this time into Latin, it became unicornus, and from there we got the English word unicorn. Whenever the Reim is mentioned in the Bible, it was almost always being used as a metaphor for the strength of God, and like father, like son, so Jesus eventually became a unicorn in medieval and renaissance art. FYI, if you're curious, it's most probable that the Reim was a wild aurochs. Setting Jesus aside for a moment to focus on a different religious figure, I'd like you to picture Buddha. Got an image in your mind? I'm guessing he looks something like this, so it might surprise you to learn that there are statues of Buddha which look like this. Where does this extreme physical discrepancy come from? Short answer, there are two different Buddhas. You'll notice that I described Skinny over here as THE Buddha. The chubby fellow on the left is actually Budai, or Hotai, which literally means cloth sack and refers to the bag he is often shown carrying. In addition to the similar name, he is also technically A Buddha, just not THE Buddha. You see, the historical figure was a Buddhist monk of the Chan tradition who attained enlightenment, thus elevating him to the status of Buddha. In the West, he is often known as the Laughing Buddha, Happy Buddha, or Fat Buddha to differentiate. The Buddha, the guy who started it all, was Gautama Buddha, and in his pursuit of the middle path, he spent a portion of his life as an ascetic hermit detached from worldly pleasures, and that's what these skeletal statues are representing. I bring it all up now because there was a time and place where Jesus also received a similar treatment. The time is the 14th century, and the place is the Rhineland. In this period, Europe saw the emergence of the Forked Cross, also known as the Upsilon Cross, Y Cross, Thieves Cross, Furca, and Crucifix Dolorosus, among other names. The Jesus which you'll typically find on one is often painfully thin and gaunt, with his physical suffering exaggerated for dramatic effect. See how his head falls low over his chest as bloody tears stream down his face. Fingers and toes are spread apart and spasmodically bent. He has narrow, sinewy arms, prominently protruding ribs, and his entire pain-racked body is riddled with bloody lesions, in addition to the gaping wound in his ribs. According to Wikipedia, the overall impression of the painted figure was intended to be so horrific that believers would be in fear and terror. Although this depiction eventually spread as far as England, northern Italy, and Spain, it remained most popular in the area around Köln, aka Cologne, where it is also known as the Mystikels Crucifix, or Mystic's Cross, as the forked cross represents the tree of knowledge and sin. When he wasn't writhing in agony on a forked cross, Jesus was also sometimes depicted being mangled in a wine press. This motif was actually rather popular, being one of the few allegorical images from Catholicism to survive the Protestant Reformation, and it's not hard to see why. The crushing lever arm of the press evokes the crossbeam of a crucifix, especially with Jesus in the same position under it that he would have been while bearing his cross to Golgotha, and regardless of your personal beliefs regarding the transubstantiation of Christ, there's always been that connection between the wine of the Eucharist and the blood of Christ. It only makes sense that you'd stick him in a press to really squeeze out that sweet, delicious Christ juice. Sometimes, however, the body horror to which Jesus is subject is a bit more... abstract, or dare I say, imaginative. In Russell's Guide to Monsters, Part 1, I mentioned the fact that this bewinged baby is a puto, not a cherub, and that biblically accurate cherubim look like this. In addition to these chimeral monstrosities, there are also the many-winged seraphim, as well as the ophanim, which are flaming wheels within wheels covered in eyes. Basically, the Bible has no shortage of trouser-soiling nightmare fuel, so it should come as no surprise that Jesus also gets Cronenberged on occasion. This is how we get the trifacial trinity. Much like homuncular Jesus, this depiction symbolized a concept and was never meant to be interpreted literally. You'd hope. In this case, it symbolized the Catholic inability to do math. After all, if they were good at it, they'd be called Mathlicks. Sorry, that was awful. Regardless of my terrible pun, paintings of Jesus' trianthropops almost always show him holding a strange triangle that resembles a point-on image of a tetrahedron. This esoteric symbol is actually the Shield of the Trinity, also known as the Scutum Fidei, Latin for Shield of Faith. That's right, it's not just a first-level cleric slash paladin spell for bumping your AC. It has the Latin names for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at the points, and God in the center, with connections saying which things are and are not the same as each other. By Catholic logic, or Cathologic, A, B, and C are all equal to D, as in Deus, but none are equal to each other, because the transitive property can go F itself. By the 15th century, this symbol had officially become the attributed coat of arms of God, much like how the skull is the attributed arms of death, but I digress. Trifacial Jesus was simply a surreal image made to symbolize the three distinct entities of the Trinity in a single person. 
Oh, somehow I almost forgot to mention Viking Jesus. Around 958 AD, Harald Bluetooth rose to power, uniting Denmark as a singular kingdom and officially converting it to Christianity while he was at it. Roughly seven years later, he erected a large runestone at Yelling, which has become known as Denmark's birth certificate, and on one side it bears the oldest known image of Jesus from Scandinavia. Here, the cross is absent, and rather than a suffering martyr dying for humanity's sins, Jesus is depicted as a triumphant king amongst the branches of the world tree Yggdrasil. At the end of the day, it's easy to make fun of weird depictions of Jesus, but as Monty Python discovered in the early stages of writing The Life of Brian, it's almost impossible to make fun of the man himself. If we take the gospel as the uh, gospel, then Jesus was fundamentally a dude going around trying to get everyone to just be nice to each other. His core ideology was one of kindness and compassion and understanding, with messages like love thy neighbor, and judge not lest ye be judged, and chase capitalists with whips. My point is, all of the ridiculous things associated with him, like televangelists, which we rightly ridicule, made their way into the canon ex post facto, but I also think we can still take lessons from these unusual depictions, which we've just spent a whole video laughing at. Take homuncular Jesus, for example. It looks ridiculous to us because we know babies don't look like that. This should remind us of the fact that we, as humans, grow and develop. It's okay to change as you get older, because nobody's perfect. Being flawed is part of being human, and there are so many ways to be human. To that end, the intersex depictions of Jesus should serve as evidence that the traditional gender dichotomy is bullshit. The artists of yore placed special emphasis on Jesus' junk not only to highlight his humanity, but also to call attention to our own. In other words, simply being human, whatever form that may take for you, is not sinful. I say, let's focus on our shared humanity, because if the Christmas season really is the time for goodwill toward man, then it's the perfect opportunity to try to make the world just a little bit kinder. Thank you. Have a blessed Yule and a fascinatingly Merry Christmas. In the description, I've placed links to two articles by co-pastors Ken Wilson and Emily Swan entitled Gender Fluid Jesus is for Real and Jesus' Vagina, a Medieval Meditation. In the former, Wilson points out that Jesus subverted two masculine institutions of his day, violence and marriage. At the time, men were expected to marry, and all notable leaders prior to Jesus were also celebrated warlords, but Jesus was having none of it and assumed a more traditionally maternal position. To quote the man, the uh, woman, the... Uh, person, themselves, regarding Pontius Pilate's execution of the Galileans, I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings. Luke 13.34. Furthermore, he, she, they, associated themselves with Sophia, the female personification of divine wisdom, and while the literally patriarchal tradition of Western Christianity has more or less forgotten and even suppressed this, the Eastern Orthodox Church has an impressive collection of icons presenting Jesus as a gender-fluid amalgamation of both Christ and Sophia. In the words of Pastor Wilson, as handy, as intuitive, as obvious as the gender binary seems in a pinch, it pinches us. It forces us into boxes of our own making. But it doesn't have to be this way. Swan adds, we can feel free to imagine God as a woman. We can meditate on Jesus giving birth to the church and to new life. We can see Jesus as gender non-binary. If we weren't so homophobic as a culture, we could even name the queerness of God without some people feeling like they've spoken heretically. As I said, Catholics don't understand math. Sure, you may argue that cats, dogs, and rats are all mammals, but none of them are the other, and you'd be right, but there's more than one mammal species in existence. According to Christian doctrine, there's only one god, never mind the fact that even leaving aside the trinity issue, the cohort of angels and saints would be classified as minor deities in any other religion, but I digress. Given that the unicorn was a well-established symbol for Jesus, I'm a little surprised I've never seen one with a horn like this. What would you even call it? I'm going with crucicorn, literally meaning crosshorn. On the other hand, the mysterious Rem was a powerful beast with horns, and given the significance of the number three in Christianity, I'm now a little disappointed that we never got to witness the awesome might of Triceratops, Jesus. I have seen depictions of Revelation's beast from the sea, which clearly took inspiration from Ceratopsids, although ironically the beast is probably the closest thing the Bible has to an antichrist, but that's a subject for another video.